Well, welcome to the uh, first seminar of our Mellon Sawyer seminar series, which is an exciting uh, set of um, presentations and discussions uh, on the theme of democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. Uh, this project was initiated by Professor Ruth O'Brien and myself, working also with Professor Omar Dabur and Richard Wolin. And we have a fantastic group of uh, faculty fellows, Mellon faculty fellows and Mellon student fellows, who've agreed to participate in the seminars uh, through the year. So we're really delighted to uh, have you here. And um, we're especially pleased to have um, Professor Aziza Alhibri uh, initiate our discussion um, uh, and to have uh, as a commentator Mukahid Bilici, who I will in, whom I will introduce in, in a moment. I would like first to just let you know our format. Um, we're hoping to have a lot of discussion, and so uh, we will be having um, our talk by our in, distinguished invited guest, to, followed by uh, the comments from our discussant. And uh, then we will perhaps take a few minutes break, um, no more than five minutes to let you stretch, and think of your questions. Uh, we will be uh, then going around the audience, uh, hopefully with a handheld mic, so we won't have to make you get up and stand in line or anything awful like that at, the, uh, at that um, microphone there. And uh, we will have a discussion. And that will be followed by um, our better-than-usual reception. Uh, people who've been to the Center for Global and Ethics events know that we um, have lots of good beer, wine, cheese, hummus, etc. cetera. Uh, but this one's even better. Um, and uh, that will be in the um, Globalization Seminar Room 5109, which will be a good opportunity for you to interact in a more personal way with our speakers. Um, this event is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics, uh, and um, we will be um, mainly bending our efforts to helping out this uh, particular set of events this year, but we've actually had one of our distinguished speakers, Shayla Ben-Habib, is in the audience today. You can see her video online at the uh, Center for Global Ethics site. Um, from her talk, and we're planning uh, for this series uh, to put the events online, um, videos online, uh, at iTunes University, which is being organized by one of the uh, research assistants for the grant, Flannery um, Amdal, over there. And in addition, we have Josh Keaton, who is a second research assistant. You know, some of you know him from the philosophy program. And we're also really pleased to have um, Adam Ettenson as our postdoctoral fellow for the year. He's over there. Uh, who is also leading, for those who might not have uh, gotten word of this, leading a reading group in the week before each uh, seminar um, to uh, get into some depth into some of the either the paper itself that will be presented or some other work by the featured speaker. So um, if you're on our list, as I assume you are, I'm sure we can extend uh, the invitation to join in that seminar reading group as well, which I think will be very useful for people. Um, our assistant, our ABLE graduate student, um, is uh, John McMahon, and he is um, what keeps everything together. So he'll be videotaping this, so um, hopefully you won't mind. We'll be putting it to benign uses <laughs> um, I hope. I mean, we will. Um, okay. So um, now turning, so um, come to our reception. Anyway, uh, now to the um, featured speaker, Aziza Alhibri. Um, she was the founding editor of Hypatia, which was really the first, um, almost the only, a philosophy journal um, about feminism, which was a very, very important move. And um, she, was, she is also the founder and president of Karama, Karama, yes, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. And she's written for uh, many years on um, issues of women's 
rights within uh, Islam and, its, and Islam and democracy and human rights within Islam. So um, she's also uh, edited several um, collections, and I want to especially call attention to her recent book, which, w- which is not quite out yet, but which will be um, finished reasonably soon, on the topic of Islamic marriage contracts in American courts. So this perfectly um, fits the theme of our, um, the overall theme of our seminar, which uh, attempts to address some of the conflicting both values and empirical um, tendencies as far as the recognition of diverse cultures within secular, uh, primarily secular, (laughs) used to be secular, liberal democracies, shall I say liberal democracies, we're among critical people here. Um, So uh, raising issues of women's human rights and of um, the tensions between the recognition of religious um, freedoms and uh, practices within the context of um, law and secular practices in, um, in, so in liberal democratic society. So there's a range of, of topics, and I will just call attention to our website, which, where you can find our entire series, the next one of which will be Ann Norton of the University of Pennsylvania, who, which will be hosted by Professor O'Brien, uh, w- uh, with a comment by Joan Wallach Scott on the theme post colonialism, Islam, and the West. So that's exciting. And we have several other good ones coming up. So check out our website, come to the reading groups. And now I will continue. So I will stop s- speaking and we will hear our guests. Um, I guess I should uh, just take this opportunity to also um, introduce you briefly to. Uh, Mukahit Bilici, who is a cultural sociologist who focuses primarily on Islam and social theory and works on both American Islam, social theory, and the Muslim intellectual tradition. And his uh, recent book, which is almost out, will be out in a month or so, it's very exciting, it's entitled Finding Mecca in America, How Islam is Becoming an American Religion. Which uh, and it was based on a dissertation which was a finalist for the American Sociological Association Best Disser- Dissertation Award. So, without any further ado, may I introduce Professor Aziz Al Hibri? Thank you for coming. Well, I come to talk to you today as the whole world is seeing some very serious developments in terms of. Uh, uh, values, diversity of values, actually. That's what at the bottom of all of this. Uh, and unfortunately, we find out that such differences could result in loss of life, uh, unfortunately. But today, let me talk about the topic that you have asked me to talk about. And I start by noting that the United States is really a microcosm of this global village which is our world. Uh, With the new connectivity in the world, um, we are feeling the diversity, whether it's in terms of religion or race or ethnicity, a lot more in the global village. But we are also experiencing it right here and now in our country. And we are trying very hard to design ways of dealing with it that are constructive and would advance us into a positive future. At the same time, we are also living the future of other countries. And that's not to be uh, American centrist or whatever you want to call it. Rather, it's the truth that in the U.S. uh, we have such advanced technology that has left its uh, imprint on our society that there are a lot of questions that are being raised in this country that are not yet raised in others. And the way we deal with them could also map the way for others to think about them. But that is not to think that we are here going to or- originate the thought of the future. I think the thought of the future is going to be an amalgam of an interaction of a lot of intellectual activity all over the world. But today I was asked to speak about the possibility of developing an Islamic jurisprudence in the diaspora given 
uh, modernity, diversity, and also given that such a jurisprudence need to be authentic or else it's going to be rejected by not only people in the U.S., Muslims in the U.S., but also people who might look to it from outside the U.S. So is that a possibility? One reason to ask that question is that recently, and not so recently, we've been hearing of Islam as an other with a really big O in this country. You know. uh, different values, different people, different concepts, different worldview. Uh, Islam is a whole different religion, and now there is this anti-Sharia movement, which is sweeping many states in this country, in which the uh, claim is that Muslims are trying to take over uh, the uh, court system, the legal system in this country by introducing Sharia law, and that will, of course, change uh, our way of life. So Muslims, again, and I say again because we had this uh, uh, example in the 1800s. Uh, many of us may have forgotten about it. Uh, and now as our uh, uh, Navy is heading towards uh, Libya, I remind you about the words uh, about the shores of Tripoli. We've been there once before. So we really need to learn uh, from history, uh, all of us over the world. We do not need conflict. We need peace and understanding. So uh, what is this Islam that we have heard so many contradictory things about and where when a Muslim stands up and tries to explain, the Muslim is called an apologist. There is power in language. There is power in naming. Okay? So I don't stand in front of you as an apologist for Islam. I stand in front of you as somebody who looked at Islam and liked it. Carol probably knows that in the old days I was a Marxist. I liked that at that time. <laughs> so at that time, I now have some critique. <laughs> I do have a critique. So um, let's talk about a few issues uh, that would take us towards the conclusion uh, that we are discussing. Does it really matter that I am an American Muslim for the Islamic law somehow to change and take me into account? That is, being in the diaspora, does that really influence Islamic law? Or Islamic law is a revealed law, right? From 1,500 years ago, it's the word of God. It's been given, done. It's over. You either believe in it or you don't. Some people think that it is static, that whatever was revealed 1,500 years ago is what Islam is. But those who actually study Islam and who know Islam would know that all the jurists of Islam have agreed over the centuries that the laws of Islam, not the basic principles, but the laws change with time and place. So that if you are in the 21st century, you're not going to have the same laws as you did in medieval times. And if you are in the U.S., you're not going to have the same laws as in Malaysia. Why? Well, let me give you an example. In medieval times, there was this very famous, continues to be famous scholar called Al-Imam Al-Ghazali. By Imam here, we mean a real senior scholar, not somebody who leads prayers. Imam Al-Ghazali lived in Iraq and developed the... Uh, sorry. Sorry, I take it back. Imam Shafi'i. <laughs> Imam Shafi'i lived in Iraq and developed the Shafi'i school of thought, which was very respected and popular. Because of political developments in Iraq, he felt that it was no longer useful for him to stay there, and he moved. He moved to Egypt. When he got to Egypt, he started preaching his Shafi'i school of thought, which is an interpretation of the revelation in the Quran. Uh, in light of the uh, precedent of the prophet and other scholarly works, okay? Then he noticed that the Egyptian society is not like the Iraqi society. So he redesigned his school of thought to take into account the new society he is in, even though the, he was in the same era. So I ask the question, if Imam Shafi'i needed to change the school of law that or his interpretation or madhab uh, of Islam that he developed in Iraq 
because he moved to Cairo, Egypt. Do you think that we have the right now, or is there a necessity to change or revisit the jurisprudence that he had designed or others have uh, produced in medieval times now that we are in the U.S., in the 21st century? And the answer is yes. And those who say no just do not understand what Islamic law is about. There are sources of Islamic law. The Quran itself is the revelation, the word of God. But then, the word of God, you need to understand it. Yes, there is a plain meaning, as you know from Supreme Court language. But also, even with plain meaning, sometimes there's a lot of interpretation around it. The same is true, not only with the U.S. Constitution, but with all sorts of uh, documents, sacred and otherwise, and Islam is one of those. The Quran is one of those. So, uh, the Juris function is to try and understand what is really being said there. Um, The prophet's uh, uh, life was to shed light on some aspects of the Qur'an through his example. So a great deal is interpreted through the precedent of the prophet. Today we hear that there are a lot of people in the uh, Muslim world who are trying to revive the example of the prophet. Unfortunately, what I see is a, a lot of beards and short pants. I do not see the humanistic example of the prophet. I do not see his treatment of women. I do not see a lot of things that are substantive about the example of the prophet uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, very formalistic aspects. So to say that uh, we can develop an Islamic jurisprudence in the diaspora, whether it is Europe or the United States, is really not to, create, not to invent something new. It's something that has been happening in the Muslim world over the centuries. Uh, Well, uh, is it relevant in the U.S., for example, that I have this kind of diversity? How does diversity influence my understanding of Islamic law, whether we're talking about religious diversity or ethnic and uh, racial diversity? Well, uh, Islam has also spoken very early on about that. As to religious diversity, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, the Quran has stated there is no coercion in religion, so that whoever would like to believe whatever he or she wants to believe, it is up to them, and in the end, it's God who's going to ask them about it, not us. And in fact, not only that, but scholars made it very clear that in their work, they cannot say, no writer could ever write and say, look, here's the right interpretation and everybody else is wrong. Because human beings are not supposed to be infallible. Only God knows the truth. And so we can only say that I am more probably correct and the other person is more likely to be incorrect. But we cannot say with certainty that we are right and they are wrong. And that That's why a lot of scholars, when they wrote their books, at the end of the chapter or the book, they would always say, these are our views, but God knows best. Wallahu a'lam. So there is a a sense of humility in their writing, uh, which we do not see in today's world. And I think the lack of humility and the lack of flexibility uh, and ability to accommodate a new society, etc., arises from ignorance of the foundations of Islam. Now, how did we get into that situation where many Muslims do not know what Islam is about? You can ask about that during the Q&A period, but that's not part of the topic today. So, in particular, Islam has uh, stated very clearly that it did not come to deny the Abrahamic religions before it. To the contrary, that the... These heavenly religions, Judaism and Christianity, worship the same God and have the same message. And in the example of the prophet, we have two important examples I will mention to you. When the prophet was invited by uh, the people of Yathrib or Medina, who came uh, to the prophet and invited him to come not only as a prophet, but as a head of state of that city-state, uh, he came in and talked to them and said, I will accept only, basically, to make a long story short, on constitutional basis. That is, we have to know what the relationship between us is. And he, uh, uh, he actually... Uh, executed a charter with the people of Medina, who consisted of Muslims and Jews. Uh, 
And in it, he said, basically, and I, I should have brought my PowerPoint here to see, show some of it, but you can also look it up by Googling. He said, you know, to each his own. So the uh, Muslim tribes are, uh, have the following duties, and the Jewish tribes have similar duties. They are, he said, one ummah. One ummah, one people. Uh, I'd like to go say that today uh, in some circles and see if I can get away with it because we have become so fractured in this world that every little group thinks of itself as an ummah. But there is a charter executed by the Prophet which says that the Muslims of Medina and the Jews of Medina are one ummah. They defend each other. They have each other's back, etc. Go look at it, the charter of Medina. The other letter, the other document I would want to talk about uh, with respect to uh, the prophet and Christianity this time, I only came to look at it uh, seriously uh, a few weeks ago in light of uh, my work on uh, on religious freedom in some other context. But the prophet went to Sinai and went to, I believe it's called the St. Catherine uh, Convent or uh, Monastery, I don't know. Um, but in Sinai, in Mount, on Mount Sinai, he executed a letter which is addressed to all Muslims in which he says that the prophet has taken an oath before God in his name and the name of all the Muslims till the end of time, till the end of time, judgment day, that the Christians will be protected, that the Muslims will have the back of the Christians, that none of their churches will be uh, harmed, uh, their, none of their religious uh, uh, leaders, bishops, etc., will pay a tax, they will be exempt from tax, very much for like what we're doing in the U.S., etc., till the end of time. And those Muslims who violate this, uh, this covenant will be cursed till the end of, of time. That was a different time, very different time from the time we're living today. That's the tradition of the prophet that we need to revive. That's the understanding of Islam and openness to diversity in terms of religion that we need to revive. But now, that's not the only diversity Islam is open to. There is the diversity with respect to race and ethnicity. And the Quran speaks very clearly about that. Uh, Islam says, and here I'll put a plug in for women's rights, even though you didn't ask about <laughs> did you? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it says in the Quran that we created you all from a single soul. A single soul. Not Adam's rib. There is no Adam rib in the Quran. It comes in the tradition. Because Muslims got very much affected by the theologies around them, whether Christian or Jewish. Uh, and so a lot of it was developed uh, affected by uh, these biblical stories. But in the Quran, there is no mention of Adam's rib. There is no mention of Eve as a temptress. To the contrary, she fell just like Adam being tempted by Satan. So we have this uh, metaphysical equality that we start with uh, uh, among the genders. And uh, on, a, on another day, we can go through it one by one and pick up the important uh, claims about how Islam does or does not treat women equally. Uh, but I do believe not only that it treats women equally, but that the Quran engages in uh, affirmative action in favor of women. That's something for a lot of people to think about since we believe the general belief is the opposite. Then when we come to the issues of ethnicity, uh, the Quran says we created you all from the same soul uh, and, and of it we created you into male and female and nations and tribes. So from the one male and female, the nations and tribes all came. We all have the same origin. What does that mean? Well, there is nothing there that would lead somebody to think that one ethnicity or one race is better than the other. And in fact, the prophet says very clearly that you are all like the teeth of a comb, equal like a teeth of a comb. There is no preference of an Arab over non-Arab or a white over a black 
or a free person over a slave because there was slavery in those times. Okay. So where do all these things come from? Not only in the Muslim society, but in the U.S. and in other countries. These are very problematic feelings that are used to divide us, uh, to create conflict. And I would argue, uh, and if you would like to go on the website of Karama, you will see some of my articles that will give you more detailed uh, information about this, that really there is a prophetic approach to things and there is um, a a um, bad approach to this, devilish if you want, Iblis, the guy who, uh, who uh, convinced Adam to eat that apple and, 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 uh, from that tree and, and uh, created conflict and lost uh, his place in, in the garden. Um, the prophetic example and the example of the Quran is about harmony, is about working together, it's about equality, because that very verse that I mentioned to you continues to say that, yes, we created you from a single soul, from a male and fe- into a male and female, nations and tribes, so that, so that you get to know each other. Not so that you could say, I'm better than you. Not so that you can competitively, in a destructive way, compare with each other, but so that you get to know each other, to enjoy each other's company, because diversity is the spice of life, something that we now in the U.S. are starting to appreciate. And then it goes on to say, for the closest to God in the sight of God are those who are more pious. So piety becomes the standard, not anything else, and piety is something that any group any one person could actually get there uh, and achieve, whether male or female, black or white, etc. And in the days of the prophet, the mu'adhan, or the person who called to prayer um, in, uh, in his days, was a person called Bilal, who came from Ethiopia, I believe. And uh, so some of the Arabs would make a little bit of fun about the way he pronounced the words. You know, they would talk or, about him, and the prophet said no. His, his footsteps are going to be the first, first footsteps into paradise. So there is a strong tradition for diversity in Islam. And you don't see it in, Islamic, in Muslim societies as much. And the question again is why are these Islamic values not being activated in Islamic societies? What is happening? What does it take to enforce them, to make them alive again? Because basically what I'm talking about are our values today here in the U.S. So as a Muslim, in fact, you'll find a lot of Muslims saying, you know, I came to the the U.S. and I found a society which is much more Muslim in its characteristics than the society I left precisely because of these humanistic values and freedom of conscience values that we uh, value in the United States, but somehow through political developments in the Muslim world have not taken place. So what is, uh, I suggest, is required to engage in an authentic um, jurisprudential activity so that we could develop a jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence, which is appropriate for the United States. Well, developing a jurisprudence, getting into the activity, is not something very simple because it has a lot of requirements that many immigrants and people, Muslims who are not immigrants, but the indigenous population do not have. For one thing, uh, the Quran was revealed in the Arabic ancient Arabic language of the Quran. Not many people understand that. Uh, And if they do, there are so many nuances they might miss. So you really need to be very strong in your understanding of the language in order to be able to understand what the Quran is actually saying. And in my paper, which I understand will be published at one point, there is an example of how if you are poor in the language, you could really make a mistake interpreting, and that mistake would remove the imprimatur of authenticity from what you're doing. And if people figure out that, you know, guess what? You're not doing good Islamic jurisprudence. You're just trying to go with the tide, appease, you know, the latest uh, uh, wave uh, of thought in the U.S. or elsewhere. You're going to lose your audience. 
But for real change, and this is what I see my role as a jurist in the U.S. to be, there is a large Muslim population in this country. Many of them do not have constitutional consciousness as immigrants. Part of what Karama will do is educate them about what is the Constitution of the United States. Not the words, the values, the history. What kind of people are we? Where did we come from? Okay? As Americans. At the same time, I also feel and have been uh, doing, uh, we feel that Karama also is responsible for educating the American Muslims, if they'd like to listen, about what Islam is from our worldview, our perspective as Americans in the 21st century. In other words, we need to do this jurisprudence that hasn't been done yet. How do we talk about women's rights in today's uh, world uh, from an Islamic perspective? Easily. But you need people who can go through the text and show how, in fact, the, the claim that Muslim women do not have equal rights is a patriarchal interpretation. That unfortunately for centuries, patriarchal jurists have been interpreting the text without benefit of a women's perspective. Now, is that a critique of the men, that they are patriarchal? Well, no, you are the product of your own society. Not only are they uh, patriarchal, but if they are from Iraq, they would have the perspective of the Iraqi people in Egypt and so on. Everybody has certain, you know, blinders and glasses and so on. I need mine. I'm an American. I'm a woman. And I'm free. And nobody is going to come and tell me the God you believe in, who's the God of justice and equality, well, you know what? He doesn't think you're a full human being. Because that doesn't at all uh, make sense. It contradicts everything I believe in. And what I believe in is based on the Quran, not on my preferences. So actually, I have traveled to at least 13 Muslim countries in part through the invitation of the State Department here in the U.S., and that was in the 90s before things got hot uh, in 2001, uh, where I took my jurisprudence to various societies. I met with the women. I met with the imams or mullahs. I met with the lawyers. I met with ministers of justice and spoke to all of them about these issues. Let me give you an example. In one country, Bahrain, I went, I can't remember the year, but it's in the 90s. I went in and I spoke about democracy. I'm the first one that I know of in the U.S. in the early 90s who published in the Law Review an article on arguing that Islam is consistent with democracy. There were a lot of people abroad, uh, religious leaders, etc., saying, no, 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 democracy is a Western concept. You know, this is intellectual imperialism. You're, gonna, you're trying to take over our way of thinking. No, we reject democracy because it is Western. The answer is no, my friends. Uh, democracy is not Western. The particular democracy in the U.S. is suitable to the U.S. The one in Britain is suitable to Britain and so on. But there is a general concept of democracy, and Islam certainly preached it from day one, and the Prophet Muhammad certainly instituted it in the Medina, in the state of Medina. But what you are seeing instead is the uh, continuation of an authoritarian system that started at one point early on in the history of Islam due to some developments we can talk about and has been propagating itself and misleading the masses as to what democracy is. But democracy, this is at the heart of Islam. Consultation, at the heart of Islam. The consent of the people, at the heart of Islam. The consent of the wife and the husband in a marriage contract, at the heart of Islam. And if the wife does not consent, there is no marriage. And yet we see, we hear of cases where women are forced by their parents to enter a marriage. Well, there is no free consent. What do you do about that? The political system has moved away from the religious values of Islam. We need to bring all that together. And we need to say, enough and stop. 
Because what we're seeing is extremism, which is not Islamic. We're seeing the lives of a people being toyed with, destroyed in many ways, made difficult in others. Women in the Muslim world had the right to vote 1,500 years ago. So when I went into a Muslim country and I uh, asked the parliamentarians there, why were they voting against women having the right to vote? They said, because in our country, women don't vote. And I said, what do you mean in our country? Well, we're a Muslim country. I said, yes. Have you read the Quran, the verse that says that the women voted for the prophet? And the parliamentarian, which in the U.S. you would call Islamist, but I wouldn't use that word because then you're ascribing his views to Islam, and I reject that. He's an extremist. He's a patriarchal. He's whatever you want. But Islamist? No, he's not. So he says, but. In our tribal culture, women can't vote. I said, that's fine. So please, when you talk to the news media, tell them it's your tribal culture and stop hiding behind God. Because women don't care about your culture. But a lot of of them are pious and they're not going to be going against the will of God and you are misleading them. So these kinds of conversations keep happening uh, Uh, between uh, people like me and people who claim some other uh, point of view. The people in Bahrain, when I went there to talk to them about, I was asked by the uh, embassy to talk about democracy and Islam. I gave my lecture. They were informed, the people, about their Islam. And when I finished, they were amazingly happy and supported and encouraged by the vision I gave them about Islamic democracy. And so when I think it was like 10.30 p.m., I left this big hall, which had hundreds of people in it, and I was getting out with the embassy staff, trying to get home to the hotel, and I look behind me, and all the people in attendance are walking behind me. And they come to me, would you have dinner with me at my home? Would you please come and have dinner at home? And I'm thinking hundreds of people want me to have dinner at their home. They were so buoyed by the idea of having a democracy. I cannot ignore that. This is now our calling, Muslim Americans and non-American jurists. We at Karama have formed a network of 400 Muslim jurists, leaders, and lawyers, movers and shakers, to put all our heads together as much as we can, and there are a lot of difficulties, to develop the jurisprudence much faster because one person alone in this country cannot do it. So we have an alliance, a partnership with women in other countries. The most outstanding I have noted in their production of very authentic jurisprudence and forward-looking are the Moroccan women. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the articles they promised they, to give me. They have finished the research. And we will use that worldwide to argue for what? They have argued that women can have political leadership in the Muslim world. Because till this day, we were first fighting the issue of vote. Now we're talking about leadership. Can she be in the cabinet? Can she be the prime minister? Can she lead her country? And a traditionalist would say no. And we would say, yeah, why not? You forgot about all these uh, Muslim women, queens and leaders, etc. throughout history. What happened there? Were they an aberration? Or is this patriarchal system that we need to get rid of an aberration? So whatever we're doing in the U.S. is not going to be limited to the U.S. It's going to reflect globally. And whatever the women are doing outside the U.S. who are our partners is going to reflect on the wealth of our information and knowledge in the U.S. and will help us develop our views further. So diversity, ethnicity, uh, you know, uh, uh, race, religion, (coughs) etc., Women's rights, all of these we have addressed and we have no problem with them. The problem is when you talk about it, you talk about it in a way that your Muslim audience understands that what you're doing is authentic. 
The only way to do that is that you base what you say on the sacred texts. So you should have quotations as we do. The Quran said this, the Quran said that, the Prophet did this, the Prophet did that, and the scholars did the following. And to really bring the most liberal aspects of Islam forward, we had to go as far back as we could. That's the paradox. 1,500 years ago, the rights of Muslim women were much clearer than they were 1,000 years ago. So we go back to the roots. We go back to the basics, and we start from there. And another example I would give you, I was in a country where I was reading the papers. I usually go to a country for three days, do three cities, and move on. Um, and I was in that city, and I read the morning papers, and in it, the headline says, Mullah so-and-so says about a certain women's rights demand, never. It will never happen. And I look at the demand. And the demand is actually something that is sanctioned by Islam. Women should have that right. So I read the article, and the women there had no idea that this is a right within the religion. They gave a, a, an argument for it which was weak and which was easily attacked by the mullah. So I asked the embassy to arrange for me a dinner with the mullah. And they said, you know, maybe, maybe you should think of something else. And I said, no, no, I really would like to have dinner with him. Can you bring him to the table? Yeah, we can bring him to the table, but he's not going to look at you. I said, I don't care. He doesn't have to look at me. We'll talk. So we went to the dinner, and we sat there, and I started talking to him about the position that he announced he would never accept. And after some discussion, he started speaking to me in Arabic. And I have noticed a lot of these mullahs and jurists do that. Why? Because he wants to know if I know what I'm talking about. That's what I was telling you about the qualifications. So I started quoting things for him in Arabic until he could not follow up with me. And uh, then he looked at me and smiled. And then we were talking eye to eye. And I gave him my argument. And he said, but can you prove that? And I said, yes. This is all footnoted in the tradition. He said, in that case, then okay. And the people sitting at the table with us said, is that a yes? And he said, yes. That's what authenticity does. I don't believe in conflict. I don't believe in embarrassing people, hitting them on the head, uh, uh, getting into hot conflict with others. I think reason is where it is at. If you know what you're talking about, sit and talk to some of these people who are willing to talk to, with you. Not everybody is going to want to talk to you, but those who are willing to talk with you, you can talk to them and you can tell them what you think about the Islamic worldview. And by the way, I would like to caution about one thing in talking about Islamic jurisprudence. I do not use the approach of taking a verse from here and a verse from there to support my, my argument. That kind of approach, we all know, philosophers and others, is very much open to manipulation because you, you can always find one verse and then something else that could say the opposite. What you really need to have is an overview of what the religion, or say what the Qur'an says. So I've taken the time to develop what I call the Qur'anic worldview. And I document that in, in my lectures. Once I've established the Qur'anic worldview, then I do what jurists have always recommended, namely that the Qur'an explains each other. That is, if you find a verse in the Qur'an you don't understand, look at another verse that might shed light on it. Because the Qur'an is a seamless web of ideas. You cannot just take one sentence or verse and give it a very liberal view, uh, interpretation you want to please everybody, and then you have something here that you are really worried about, you don't know how to explain, but push it aside, we don't want to talk about it now. That's not how honest and authentic jurisprudence work. So we have to develop an overall view and then ask ourselves how in that Quranic view these parts fit. And that's what I do. And people 
might disagree with me in the Muslim world, some of them, but a lot do agree with me. But whether they agree or disagree, they respect the view and they view it as authentic. And that's the beginning of a very important conversation. What we are doing is very important. Not only for the U.S., where Muslims have been viewed and cast as an other, but in the whole world. The events that we are seeing now on the ground in some Muslim countries should not have taken place. What's behind them is not religion. What's behind them is otherness, powerlessness, conflict, politics. And these we need to resolve. If we take humanity seriously. The Quran says we have given dignity to the children of Adam. Notice the dignity is given by God to the children of Adam, not to Muslims, not to Christians, not to Jews, but to all the children of Adam, male and female, black, red, whatever. And we need to put these values into practice in the Muslim world, and that could happen only through education. The philosophy of the Quran is one of gradualism, that you educate until these ideas get entrenched in a person's consciousness and heart, and then they live that life. You don't force it upon them. So the discussion in the U.S. about these uh, anti-Sharia laws, the claim that Muslims, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming, they're going to take over the system, you know, all of these kinds of talks are not conducive to understanding among the people in the United States. Uh, let me uh, talk about one issue, which is the uh, Islamic uh, law in American courts, and then I'll stop because I think I have another seven minutes or so. Um, the anti-Sharia bills are, are a movement that is demanding through the legislatures, that American law be supreme in U.S. courts. That's one interpretation. Or that foreign law is not permitted in American courts. Okay? So, whichever formulation you're looking at, uh, let me start with the first, that the American law is supreme. I would tell you as a lawyer that these bills are superfluous. Why? Because we already know that American law is supreme in U.S. courts. And any judge who does the opposite is not only wrong, they should throw him off the bench. <laughs> he doesn't know the importance of the supremacy clause, right? I think the function of these anti-Sharia bills are not to reassert the superiority or supremacy of American law in the U.S., but to create the fear that if we don't do something about it to reassert it, some other weird, different system is going to take over our court system. By doing that, we have really created a great deal of suspicion and worry in the population about Muslims as others. We have also created a lot of fear and uh, 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 serious uh, psychological damage in some of the Muslim population about the way they're being talked about. In one Midwestern country I was visiting, when we were talking about the anti-Sharia bills, I heard that some women had a conversation between them, veiled women. And you see, the anti-Sharia bill says anyone who adheres to Sharia can be thrown in jail. That's one of the earlier ones. Uh, I don't think it passed, but that's one of the texts. And these women saw it, and they're saying, what if the police stops us on the street and says, why are you, why, why are you covered? Why are you wearing a head cover? What do you tell him? My religion? Ah, so you're adhering to Sharia. Let me put you in jail. In the United States? So these women, who were immigrant women, who do not know 
their rights under the Constitution decided that if a police stops them, they will say, well, I'm covering my head because I have a skin disease. I thought that was very sad, very, very sad, that in the United States, women are afraid to speak their conscience and to practice their religion when we have a First Amendment. And that we have to put an end to, and it is all our responsibility. Because, listen, you all know, one minority goes, the rest will follow. <laughs> it's a mentality, right? So what is this other thing about foreign law? And then I'll wrap up. There are two kinds of levels of this. One of them is that the Supreme Court has, off, has sometimes liked to consult what other countries are doing on a certain issue so that they will have a universal view so that the U.S. is not developing its jurisprudence totally in isolation of the world. Uh, some very conservative people have rejected that idea. But that's a point of difference among judges. That's not, I think, what is being referred to here. What's being referred to here is the importation of, uh, of uh, foreign law into American courts as follows. And I will start by giving you an example that many of you may recognize. The New Jersey case on domestic violence of last two years ago by now. Have you? Do you remember it? If not, I'll brief you. This is where... Uh, a guy uh, from an Arab country, actually he was in the U.S., I don't know if he was a resident or a citizen or, or neither, but he went home and he got himself a wife. And he lived in New Jersey and he was physically abusing her. And in ways that you cannot prove, I mean like in her private parts so that you couldn't see the damage he's causing her, pretty bad, Right? driving her nuts. So one day she just found a way to get out of the house because he used to lock her in and ran into the streets where some women found her, took her into a shelter and started an action against the husband. And the husband's defense was, my religion allows me to beat up my wife. And the judge said, oh, okay. The judge said, okay. Says the religion, he didn't know. And, of course, everybody went berserk. First of all, the Muslims. Okay. And, they were, and that judge was reversed. Thank God for courts of appeal. We always have checks and balances in this country. The anti-Sharia movement says that they base their movement on this case and others like it where Islamic law is is oppressive of women, is uh, against our values and needs to be stopped and cannot come in American courts. But basically, taking away weird cases like that, in what way does Islamic law come into American courts? That's what I'm writing about. A Muslim, a man and woman are married either in the U.S. or abroad, and the marriage does not work out, not unique to Muslims, it happens a lot in the U.S. They go to court to divorce, and they have a marriage contract, which is Islamic, which has certain terms. It's like a kutuba. okay? So the judge cannot really opine on religious matters. We have separation of church and state. So what does he do? Uh, the husband gets his witness, expert testimony, and the wife gets expert testimony. The judge balances the two and decides what the contract means and then acts accordingly. If we do not allow Muslim women to go to court to divorce their husbands based on this marriage contract, they will be penalized, not the men. And that's because of the terms of the contract, because of various laws within Sharia as developed now, which I will not go into, but the losers are the women. We're taking away important protection of Muslim women if we say that they cannot take their marriage contract, which is a contract. A court in New Jersey said, look, forget about the religious aspect of this. It's, let's look at it as just a contract. He promised to pay her a certain amount of uh, money at divorce, etc. Enforce it. So if we say, no, 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 women cannot go to court with their contract, they can't enforce anything. They lose their rights. That's not right. 
And then women, Muslim women, would have been selected uniquely from our, among other women in this country for this treatment. Because if you look at the history of the law, Jewish men, women have gone to court, Catholic women have gone to court. A lot of people have taken their marriage contract and gone to court, and there was no question. But now we're saying Muslims cannot do it. So it violates the Constitution. So the anti-Sharia movement is either redundant because it's saying something we know already, that the law is supreme, the American law, or it is unconstitutional because it's asking for special treatment against Muslims, in particular Muslim women, in American courts. And maybe you will appreciate that some of the anti-Sharia bills have carved out that where the contract is business contract, that we can get into court. Okay. So we see what is going on here. A lot of patriarchal interests are at work, and some others that are not really within the uh, uh, realm of what we call the humanist movement in this world and in the U.S. So what I'm asking of you today, and you can in Q&A uh, develop these ideas more, is to start thinking of Islam not in terms of what you read in the papers, not in terms of the selective images you see on television. I usually ask my students, Muslim and non-Muslim, and believe me, the Muslims first, to forget what they think they know, <clears throat> because they don't know. What we have all are stereotypes, whether it's an Arab stereotype of Islam or an American stereotype or a God knows what stereotype. Let's go beyond the stereotypes. Let's get to the principles, because then we can all live in peace and cooperation and harmony together. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. And now we're going to hear a few comments uh, by Mukahit Bilici, who is, I should have said, a professor in, in sociology at John Jay College, our very own CUNY professor to comment, and also a Mellon Fellow. Well, thank you very much. I know it's the end of the day, and uh, I'm torn between, you know, reading notes or speaking directly to you, so I'm going to go for the second one. Uh, my own area of my field is American Islam. I study Muslim citizenship, how Muslims become uh, American uh, in, in terms of cultural citizenship and so on. And uh, so I'm going to partly share some of my observations and pose a couple of questions at the end to uh, uh, Professor al Hibris uh, uh, about her paper. And since her speech wasn't exactly the entirety of the paper, part of it might be uh, specific to the paper. Anyway, obviously we live in Islamophobic, Islamophobic times and uh, a time of heightened anxiety about Islam and Muslims. There is a planetary encounter of religious identities which generates fear, anxiety, and need for rethinking about crime and punishment and law and society. A hate movie made in America here leads to murder and destruction in Libya. There is almost a generalized diasporic condition where we feel deroutinization, anxiety. We are in a sense of agoraphobia, an effect of globalization and immigration of Muslims in particular. So this sense of Unsettlement, anxiety is more, most acute in the case of immigrants. Immigrant is characterized by anxiety, whereas citizen is characterized by security. That's what they are obsessed with and what, what they try to either preserve or overcome. Muslims are predominantly immigrants in this country, and uh, their arrival here gives rise to new questions, new issues, uh, and the applicability of Islamic law the question of whether they should extend the existing law to this new frontier uh, space or whether they should generate a new law specific to that place is a question underlying uh, the debate about Islamic jurisprudence in the West or in America in particular. So 
not only Muslims are suffering from this anxiety of establishing themselves, settling in new space, digesting mentally, existentially, the new environment in which they find themselves as minorities in a foreign uh, environment, but also they are being resisted. They are constantly being reminded. And I'm not going to go into the uh, specifics of you know, Islamophobic reactions that were typical talk of uh, Muslims being discriminated as, as a minority. What I'm interested in is the fact that all this Sharia talk that we see today, the Sharia movement, is actually a symptom of normalization of Islam in America. It's a symptom of Islam becoming part of American society. And we, you see this clearly from, in the shift from jihad to Sharia. Jihad was a military political concept around which a whole Islamophobic discourse was organized for many years. And that was the decade of 9-11. Today, we have moved from jihad to sharia, which is a legal social concept, uh, which is not treating Islam as something external and threatening. It is treating it as a domestic problem, hence American courts, anxiety about American law, and so on. Muslim cultural settlement and cultivation of citizenship is an agonistic process. One sees traces of this struggle in al hibris paper. Let me give you an example. It's a topic I thought about, and it's a chapter in my book. I hope it will be of interest to you. And that is the juridical distinction between Darul Harb and Darul Islam. Typically, you will come across it in Islamophobic literature as the house of war versus house of Islam. That the world is divided into two spaces, two territorial spaces. One is a place where Muslims live and Islam is dominant. And the rest is a space where war is at place. And this is often presented as, in, as a case, as a ground for incompatibility of Islam with contemporary democratic values, uh, modern conceptions of law and state. A lot of Muslims also subscribe to this idea, strangely enough. And Muslim intellectuals, people like Tariq Ramadan, for example, they want to minimize the relevance of this distinction, and they try to actually overcome it by eliminating it from the discourse, which is a noble effort in terms of establishing a kind of healthy relationship between Muslim minorities in Europe and America and Western societies. But... The rather interesting thing is the fact that somehow, not you, I'm feeling a little sleepy, so <laughs> I hope you will forgive me on that. Darul Harb, when you, and then you have the Western case, which is you have uh, Hobbes or Locke, and there is a uh, social contract, how nice, consent-based societies, people coming together, and so on. On a closer scrutiny, however, you discover that Actually, Darul Islam, the space of chaos, Darul, excuse me, Darul Islam, this place of security, Islam means uh, peace at the same time. So it's also Darul Salam, it is Jerusalem, it is the same concept. So Darul Islam, Darul Salam, Jerusalem are the same thing. It is the place where there is contract. And Darul Harb is Hobbesian state of nature. All the attributes of state of nature in Hobbes are the same attributes of Darul Harb, what, is, what passes as house of war. So Muslims early on, at least medieval Muslims, they lived in a pre-planetary world where there was a, a space, a city, so to say, where there was a contract, a canopy within which uh, people lived in mutual agreement and uh, a peace, and beyond it, it was a uh, agonistic sphere. It was a juridical void, so it was characterized by war, anxiety, and so on. There was no law in the absence of law. Anything is just. So it turns out this Darul, Harb, Darul Islam distinction is actually not only in contradiction with Western tradition, it is so similar to it that uh, it seems like more a problem of translation, if you will. And 
I'm approaching this issue not from a perspective of an apologist, but rather someone who wants to understand uh, these concepts. So American Muslims who arrived in this country, initially they perceived this country as a foreign place. A lot of them considered it as an impure place, and we are here temporarily. They were here for either work or for school, and after acquiring knowledge and technology, they would go back to their homeland, and they would minimize their exposure to the negative uh, effects of American society. And so the dominant uh, notion was this distinction between Darul Hab and Darul Islam. But after a while, this opaque space that in which they found themselves start to appear as a potential venturesome space where they can engage in what they call dawah, the notion of dawah, propagation, uh, missionizing, uh, and trying to, reach in, uh, trying to reach out to people. So America is uh, removed, uh, it is, America becomes a Darul Dawah rather than Darul Harb, a place of missionizing. It's an opportunity space. And uh, this characterizes 70s or so in, in American Muslim discourse. And later, as Muslims discover that they are going to stay here, they're part of here, they start to see some good aspects in American society. They, they see some fairness and they see goodness in non-Muslim individuals and faiths and so on. And so there is this new uh, turn towards seeing that place as a contractual place. So Muslim, Muslim encounter with uh, the idea of uh, social contract uh, takes place at the stage of Darul Ahd, which is what uh, Tariq Ramadan uh, offered as a solution initially to the dichotomy of Darul Ahd and Darul Islam. It is much later that Muslims discover that, well, you know what? Actually, America is more Islamic than Muslim countries. You are free to practice your religion. There is no oppression. And uh, what is the point of uh, Islamic State? Islamic State is not uh, responsible for delivering religion. It's responsible for securing uh, freedom so that people can practice their religion. And so they start to think that America is more Islamic than the Muslim world, and America becomes Darul Islam, while Muslim world recedes back into the status of Darul Harb, a place of chaos, a place to be avoided, characterized by authoritarianism and dictatorships and so on. So, so I'm, I'm giving you this uh, example just to um, show that with some effort at translation, cultural and uh, theoretical translation, uh, the obscurity and scariness of Islam can be uh, at least uh, in part uh, eliminated so that we can see the picture much, uh, a little uh, clearer. Now I want to go back to your uh, paper. And at some point you say that it is not only possible to develop a traditionally based Islamic jurisprudence suitable for America, but in fact we have an obligation to develop such jurisprudence. It's not only possible to develop it, but it's an obligation, it's a necessity. There's a very interesting idea in Islamic law that I learned uh, much later as I was looking into those issues. And it says that if, if you are the best person in a field, in an area, in terms of thinking and making a reasoned judgment, it's your obligation to make ijtihad. If there are better people, you know, uh, greater scholars, more expert people, more pious people, then it is better for you to follow them. This is very interesting. It, it makes every Muslim a mujtahid, uh, every Muslim a uh, jurist, in a sense, in the play, in when, wherever they are, uh, in, especially in situations where they are minority or they are alone, they have to make a decision. So law consists of norm and decision, and when Muslims immigrate to frontier spaces like America, they no longer have the norm, but they have decision. So juridical uh, structure is, has not been cultivated enough. So everything appears fresh, almost violent, and uh, normos uh, needs to be uh, created uh, in that uh, new place. So Muslims first cling on to the notion of necessity, darura. Uh, they say, it, out of necessity, we have to we, we can allow this. For example, if Muslim from Saudi Arabia believe that a Muslim 
from that country thought that women shouldn't drive, which is not justifiable by any uh, mainstream Islamic account. But even if he thought so, when he comes to this country, he thinks, you know what, here it's, it's a necessity. And so he says it's okay to, to have uh, that as a uh, normal practice. Now, Muslims first cling on to this necessity, and out of necessity they cultivate law, uh, which a notion you use in, in your uh, paper is uh, public good, which is maslaha. And so this shift and movement from necessity to public good is a movement towards development of Islamic law in Western context. In other words, what is the point in, in talking about this? Uh, Islamic law is not a Kantian nomothetic law. It's not a universal uh, set of rules. It, is, it, it consists of universal principles, which are not specific. And it is a living law, which means it takes different shapes in different contexts. One of the questions that social science and humanities people might raise is the idea that Islamic law is irrational. Most prominently, Weber used the notion of Qadi justice to talk about Islamic legal practice. Weber, who classified Islam as a warrior religion, also considered Qadi justice to be a problem for Muslim societies in terms of develop, development of discipline, something needed for rational legal authority. Before posing my question, let me say that I want to get your opinion on, on this, on the notion of Qadi justice. Let me say something about the irony of this claim that Weber has. Weber himself recommended an interpretive sociology in his writings, that uh, the study of human action, I, human behavior is historical and uh, it, it, should, it cannot be positivistic, the study of it. It has to be interpretive. It's an hermeneutical thing. And uh, while he recommended this as a methodological approach, he himself didn't practice it. Weber was quite positivistic in his studies. And he criticized Qadi justice for uh, not being rational, being irrational, and so on. Qadis themselves are more Weberian. They are practicing Weber's idea, his recommendation. While Weber's own treatment of Qadi justice is on Weberian. So that's an uh, ironic uh, fact about his take on Qadi justice. Now my question for you is, how would you respond to the Weber's claim that Islamic law or Qadi justice is irrational? The I notion would of say rational... that he doesn't... Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, after I'm done, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got me all excited. <laughs> okay. I'm almost done. Also in your paper, you, you talked about uh, diversity, and I have some concern with your use of diversity in characterizing Islamic jurisprudence. Your emphasis seems to be on choices, options, different alternatives, etc. And this sounds right and appropriate to American ears and our contemporary sensibilities. But isn't Islamic jurisprudence as diversity not because it has too many schools and scholars and, or multiple legal systems from which you can choose. Rather, it is diverse because it is a living law, a law that is reborn in each case. Therefore, the question of developing a new Islamic jurisprudence sensitive to American society is it a question of extending the existing law, merely applying it properly to the new situation, or is it a question of developing something new, something parallel? Uh, often people start or think that it is the second one and they end up with the first one. So I, I would like to hear what you think about that. And I'm gonna stop here and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Okay, um, we're very keen to hear uh, your questions. So, um, 
and uh, which, and also, of course, Professor Ali Bree's reply. We're going to take just a five-minute break, seriously five minutes, not more. Please prepare your questions, and we'll be excited to hear the discussion that follows. <laughs> 